My name is Eric Lonergan. I'm a fund manager and economist, but I am here uh, as a citizen, um, a concerned citizen, and hopefully an informed citizen. You, you can be a judge of the, uh, the latter. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank everybody for, for inviting me here to speak. Uh, I feel very privileged, and also for everybody, thank you to all of you for attending to listen to this. Uh, there are only so many uh, presentations in succession on economics it is reasonable to expect anyone to listen to. Um, at least they're going to be restricted to uh, supposedly to less than 10 minutes. So what I would like to describe today is a very simple policy uh, which is a number of very very important characteristics. The first thing I want to say straight away is that virtually no serious economist denies that this policy would work. Okay, so we have a wealth of empirical evidence that this policy works. And when I say works, I mean it raises demand, it raises spending. And that is the main macroeconomic problem that the Eurozone currently faces, which is Mario Draghi at Jackson Hole uh, a year or so ago made this very clear that the problem in Europe is insufficient spending. We need more investment spending, we need more consumer spending, because in simple terms, the European economy is able to produce more than it is currently spending. Right? And that is causing an unemployment rate that is too high and an inflation rate that is too low, threatening the risk of deflation. And a high unemployment rate and deflation carries huge social and economic costs. Um, and I want to reiterate um, what Frank was saying earlier, which is, yes, there is an economic recovery occurring, but there's two key points. We could do an awful lot better than this. It is way too slow, and slow growth has huge economic costs. And secondly, equally important, there is no contingency plan. Right? That is the truth. Okay? If there's a renewed recession in the Eurozone, there is no current policy that can bring that recession to an end quickly and that can plausibly counteract that recession. Right? More QE, more negative interest rates, uh, a failing fiscal regime. There is simply no contingency plan. We need a contingency plan. So what I would like to do is first of all outline this policy. I'm then going to explain briefly why I think it's necessary. I then want to contrast it and explain why it is very clearly superior to both the fiscal choices we have today but also to the current monetary regime. And finally I will conclude by arguing that it's not just a legal policy, it's arguably a legal obligation of the European Central Bank. So I believe this policy is both entirely consistent with the legal mandate of the ECB, and because it has the highest probability of returning the Eurozone to price stability, it is in fact an obligation of the policy authorities. Okay, so let's deal with the first issue. What am I actually proposing? So the proposal is very simple. In order to meet its objective of price stability, which was defined by the ECB under the intellectual guidance of Otmar Issing as being an inflation rate at close to 2%, in order to meet that mandate, I think the, the, most, uh, the highest probability of success is that the European Central Bank would make transfers directly to the bank accounts of households within the Eurozone. Now, there are a number of ways this could be done, which is something we can uh, discuss in the Q&A. Uh, it could be done through the banking system through a form of, of a loan structure, but the essential point is that the ECB should make cash transfers directly to households, and households would make the spending decisions as to what is done with those cash transfers. To put some sense of what order of magnitude we're discussing, in order to close the output gap, which is the difference between how much Europe can produce and how much Europe is, is currently producing, it is plausible that we would need to transfer something like 2 to 5% of GDP, which would be equivalent to something like 600 to 1,500 euros per capita. That's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. Now, I want to be very clear that although this is an innovation in monetary policy, it is not an innovation in conventional economics. This is a very, very straightforward, well-rehearsed and well-established economic policy. Uh, in the United States, there have been multiple occasions in the last 20 years when the federal government effectively has made direct transfers to households and all of the empirical evidence shows that that stimulates demand. It boosts spending. 
It is absolutely the case that some of it will be saved, and that's no bad thing. I think that's one of the attractions of this policy, is that households themselves will decide what, what is optimal to do with the money that they receive. The key point, however, is that it unambiguously raises demand. It addresses directly the problem that we face. Now, it's worth preempting a number of typical objections to this. The first is often that people are concerned about the central bank getting involved in transfers. Fiscal effects, redistribution effects. Well, the first point to bear in mind is that all of the current conventional policies have fiscal effects and involve transfers. Okay? So again, we can come back and discuss these, and I'm sure other speakers will address these issues. But if you look at QE and negative interest rates, it is effectively a transfer from the financial sector to the government sector, right? So there is a direct impact of negative interest rates and combined with QE on the fiscal positions of governments in the Eurozone. Every time interest rates are changed, there is a transfer within the economy, right? From one group, uh, savers to borrowers is the typical way it is described, but it's also a transfer in lots of other ways. So all uh, monetary policy transactions, all economic activities involve uh, transfers and involve fiscal consequences. In fact, the attraction here of this policy is it is entirely fair. Okay? It discriminates against no interest group. It's not saying I'm going to favor borrowers, lenders, old people, young people. It is treating everybody equally and saying that uh, all European citizens should benefit in the same way from a monetary stimulus, should be benefit equally from monetary stimulus. And not only that, we will not try and force them to do something that they don't want to do, which is essentially what policies are currently trying to achieve. We will allow them to decide how they want to spend the money. Okay, so that is the principle uh, of how it would work. Why is it necessary? Um, the, the main reason why it's necessary, if we could just show the, um, yeah, on this slide here. The main reason why it's necessary is, is multiple. Um, first of all, the effects of current policies are highly uncertain and speculative. Um, there is no serious contingency plan. Uh, negative interest rates in particular, uh, we have no precedent and no evidence that they're effective. By contrast, uh, cash payments to households is very well understood, uh, is recognized by all spectrums in economics. Milton Friedman in 1968 recommended this as a policy response to zero interest rates and liquidity trap. Gottfried Haberler, the Austrian economist, recommended it. It's a Keynesian policy Ben Bernanke has recommended. The empirical evidence we have from the states shows that it is very clear. And as I have already said, it is fair and discriminates against no part of the economy. Okay, now how can we compare and contrast this to conventional or current fiscal and monetary policies? Well, if we look at um, the nature of current fiscal and monetary policy, um, there's a very clear set of pros and cons. Right? The advantages of fiscal policy is that they impact spending directly which is precisely what Richard was describing. Um, also, fiscal policy can be used to support other objectives, such as infrastructure spending. The problem we have, however, is there's no consensus on fiscal policy. It's not timely. We can't, it doesn't impact the economy next week. There are huge lags, it involves planning. It's difficult to coordinate, and there are vested interests that oppose it. Now, monetary policy has almost the opposite uh, pros and the opposite cons. Monetary policy can be done, a conference call can be called right now by Mario Draghi and the ECB can decide to uh, cut, cut interest rates. The problem is it doesn't impact spending directly. It requires interference through the financial system which as we've already heard outlined is extremely problematic and it works direct, indirectly. Okay, so cash payments direct from the ECB to households is superior to both of those options, because it does impact spending directly, it can happen extremely quickly, and it is fair and equivalent to all. Okay, I want to move forward a couple of slides to the issue of the legal obligations of the ECB. If you read all of the legal statutes that relate to the ECB, there are really three main overriding principles. The first one is that its legal objective is to generate price stability. The second one is that it has to be independent. And the third is that it cannot finance the government. Those are the three overriding uh, legal principles. Oops. Now, this, this policy um, 
directly deals with each one of those. The ECB remains independent. Um, it is not financing fiscal activity, so it requires no coordination with the Treasury, and it is actually a prerequisite for the ECB to meet its objectives of price stability.